It's 2020 and the cyber threat landscape is changing. So who better to talk to than a rep from ESET head office in Toronto, Canada. I went there on Monday and had a chance to sit down. Stick around. We're going to have the interview in just a couple of moments. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. Nice to have you here. It's episode number 640 and been quite a week. Uh, my fitness tracker is working like crazy. Excellent. Nice. Yeah. How's yours going? Oh, mine is going How's awesome. How's yours going? Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's is kind of keeping track. I got 4,200 steps today. I've got a oh. 78 beats per minute heartbeat right now. This thing is telling me my uh, my blood pressure as well, which is kind of cool. That's a bonus for me because I do lean toward a little bit of a higher blood pressure. Right. So that, knowing when I need can to I just see that. Yeah. How does yours do blood pressure? Uh, well, it it actually uses a uh, an optical sensor. Yeah. It's it shines a a green light into the veins on my wrist. Right. And then there's an optical sensor that reads that and is somehow able to determine. I don't the, know. I, I think, don't know the I like science that, behind it, but yeah, it, yeah it's very, very pulse, handy. But it doesn't do blood pressure. So but- I'm 127 over 81 right now. Oh, okay. At uh, 80 beats per minute. Nice. So does that does that sound pretty close 80, to good? Yeah, like, that's good. I'm, I'm just I'm 89 beats per minute. I'm so. just learning how like all these things kind of equate, and I've got the scale that's helping me to to get healthy. So you know, off the top of the show, just kind of getting into it because we're we're following up with our kind of health tracking for 2020 because we're using technology like our fitness trackers in order to be able to get healthier for 2020. I've got the scale. I'm using it twice a day and people are telling me, you know what, just use it in the morning. And I'm like, yes, I would like to use it in the morning because usually I'm lower weight in the morning. So I'd feel really, really good about that. Right. But occasionally after a good day of self-discipline, I'm actually lower in the evening. And so, you know, I'm like, that's encouraging. So I'm taking averages and I'm, I'm sticking to that. Um, my low carb and, uh, alternative this week, because I'm trying for low carb so that I can burn fat, um, is I replaced taco shells with romaine lettuce. Oh, that's actually a I've good done that choice. Before. I yeah. had tacos that is yummy. in romaine lettuce. And at first, you know, when I'm making it, I'm like, this is a dietary thing to try to reduce the carbs. Mm-hmm. As I'm eating it, I'm like, this is freaking delicious. Well, also, it doesn't break in the middle and everything falls. It was so good. It is. It was yeah. really, really good because I like to have shredded lettuce on my tacos. But, but it's always like falling that. all over. Yeah. The, yeah. So you just skip that and just roll it up in a piece of romaine lettuce. It the was only delicious. downside is if the meat is really hot, yeah. that heat transfers through the lettuce and you're like, oh, ah, yeah. this is hot. So no, sometimes I've good. had to use a couple layers of lettuce. Well, lettuce. But there you go. So, you can do that for uh, burger buns too. And in fact, I've seen that that's funny iceberg. because um, I, I actually went out to A&W with my son. Okay. And A&W, we talked about they have the vegetarian burgers and he's a vegetarian. So, yeah. so he got that and I had a regular burger, but they have there at A&W. So this is a fast food restaurant. Yeah. What they call lettuce wrap. Oh, mm-hmm. So I guess, you know, perfect. that maybe inspired the idea, but so they actually replaced the button with lettuce. Yes. It was messy as heck. <laughs> It really was. The easiest, but it was delicious. Well, sure. It was really, really good. The easiest way to do it, though, is you take an iceberg lettuce. Yes. Yeah. And chop the slice sides it. off. No. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The slice the sides yeah. off so that way it has that bun shape and then yeah. you put it in the middle. See, that makes sense. See, they wrapped it in lettuce. Oh, yeah. So it was like lettuce leaves wrapped. Yeah. And it was really delicious. Like, it really has a nice taste. And I find I'm actually, I'm kind of realizing I don't really like the bun. Like, the bun is like, filler yeah and takes away from the taste but as soon as you wrap it in lettuce it's like you get the full flavor explosion right and 
so I, I really did like it. So that's funny that you mentioned that. Maybe that birthed the, the idea. The, so, yeah. Of, uh, lettuce instead exactly. of bun. Yeah. So what else have you been this doing? This is a tech show, by the way. It is. <laughs> I'll, I'll take it. I'm using the tech. Yes. Like this and the, and the digital scale to be, to be able to monitor my progress. Right. So that, and I'm using that tech so that I can try to achieve the goals that I've never achieved before for New Year's, right? Like right. my New Year's resolutions. Like this is the idea. Yeah. So we right. do have, incidentally, we have a new chat channel on our Discord server. So the I official Category today. 5 TV server. Yeah, it's called Biggest Loser. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've never I've never really realized but I really want to be the biggest loser. <laughs> Uh, well, in high school, already got the number well, one bald nerd. I will, I'll tell you. <laughs> in that school, I was the biggest loser. This is completely different. <laughs> I caught the bug from la like the last episode when we were talking about yeah. it, and also from the the actual Discord chat. Mm -hmm. So I have taken it up as well. Have you now? Yes, but I'll tell you my my. Thing, Your motivations my, are different than my mine. motivations are one hundred percent video games. Video games. Yeah. You just okay. want to play more video games. So you're like, I'm going to, so this is my diet, video games. Well, you all know that I have a VR. Yeah. Right you're there. showing off now. So instead of just sitting on the couch and watching TV, like I do oh, all the time, physical instead, fitness, I've been playing a game called the knockout league, which if you do have a VR headset, Please, I don't. I please want. Tell me how to annihilate Crimson Fang. But my whole body <laughs> hurts. Like I, it's obviously doing something because okay because I'm you know squatting to dodge and the opponents are right in your face. Wow. Right, and they're throwing punches and the accelerometers in the actual sensors can tell how hard you're punching, which for me is not that hard, so I never win. Um, <laughs> It sounds so cool. Yeah. And like, I'm sore because I went to, I took my youngest son to a trampoline place oh, yesterday. that's fun. And so I was bouncing on the trampolines for about 45 minutes. And I'm the guy that, I'm not doing flips and stuff. I'm just yeah. bouncing, 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 bouncing. And then 45 minutes in, you're like, oh my goodness. Everything My hurts. ankles really hurt. Yeah. <laughs> this is a painful thing, but it was worth it, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I I just have been fighting VR. I've been playing video games. That's really neat. But like way way to take the whole like technology for physical fitness and physical health mm -hmm. to the next level and thinking VR could be used. Yeah, I've seen VR games that are really really physically intensive, mm -hmm. um, and uh, taking you know looking at the Wii Fit for example way back in the day yep. mm -hmm. and thinking okay this is the next evolution of that where you're actually like Beat Saber looks amazing to me. Yes, I, I can't wait to try it. I play a game called Audio Shield which is very similar to Beat Saber. Yeah. Um, and so I'm holding shields and these orbs are coming at my face and I have to punch them out of the air. But every once in a while, depending on the beat of the music, I also have to duck under the bar. Like, the, oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're physically like, like getting into to, it. Yeah. And, yeah. That sounds so awesome. So what I'm saying is to help you in 2020, mm -hmm. you, you ought to get a VR headset. Sasha, did I mention two shows ago that my budget was a hundred bucks total? I think that yeah. that yeah, not getting that, VR for bucks. No. that goal needs to be edited. Yeah. Which you can do post production. <laughs> right? If everybody buys the scale that I demonstrated. <laughs> how does that sound? Then we'll get into some VR and we'll see how that looks. I think that that would be a, a really really fun way to get physically like just mm -hmm. into the game for sure. Mm -hmm. Even looking at like the Orville interactive fan experience, like I would love in VR to be able to walk through the Orville ship. Yes. That would be so cool. You know what I'll do is I'll have Dave record on my phone yeah. a video of me trying to beat Crimson Fang, which I will not because I, I cannot. But this so is far. a video of you, like, I'll, is he holding it up to it. the screen or is he? It. I'll post it. On the, Are you going to do this? Well, loser. Yeah. Because you'll oh, be able to be see great. it. You'll be able to see the fight on the video, like on the TV screen. It'd just be Sasha being like, eh. <laughs> please don't hit me please don't hit me <laughs> yeah i'll do it Whatever. that'd be great there's no shame here that'd be amazing yeah um so i mean i've just been using the tech that i have and it's really really rudimentary compared to the kind of cool stuff that you have but you know it's a it's a start anyway so i'm going for the low carb to try to burn fat that's yes. the idea and, and you like have you increased your like veggie intake and incidentally because you got to eat right and it's like okay well if i'm not eating buns and bread and mm -hmm. pasta i'm gonna get 
what am I doing instead of pasta? I'm doing sh- um, spiralized zucchini. Yes. Which looks and ta- and has the texture kind of of like a uh, like a linguine. Yes. If you will. So, mm-hmm. but but tastes fantastic. So yeah, I'm getting more vegetables. Good. Today's lunch was like cucumber and carrots and cottage cheese and some peanuts. Right. You know, as as something to get through the day. That's you guys are just good. having this conversation. What's going through my head is a lesson I learned back when I used to watch Sesame Street. One of these things just doesn't belong here. Yeah. Because I had a sub and pulled pork for supper, and my watch congratulated oh, me for getting up to go to the bathroom. Oh, this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like good you're job still you're a- active you're still able to stand congratulations <laughs> it's like, we are polar opposites right about now <laughs> i don't know that that's true because my motivation is not like i'm not like okay i need to lose 100 pounds i'm not I'm no not, you were looking to educate yourself i'm looking to educate myself so that i can be more healthy for the future because i right. want to live a long healthy life i want to be here for my kids i want to be as physically fit as i can be without like i understand my limitations as a tech nerd, I know that I'm not going to be the guy that's working right. out every day. It's yeah. just not me. It's not going to happen. And even if I set that as a goal, which some of us tend to do as a goal, I'm not going to achieve that. Mm-hmm. Right. It's impossible for me. So my goal instead is just to educate myself and try to eat a healthier diet based on the information that these digital apparatuses give me. Mm-hmm. And, right. and it's really making a, a difference. So I'm down about three pounds. That's that awesome. is awesome. Um, which is, you know, it's, a, it's little, but it's something. It's and, and it's consistent. It's the right direction, which exactly. yeah. always happen at the beginning. So just yeah. know that. And I've lost one year off of my metabolic age. You'll also find that as you start losing weight, you start to pick up losing weight. It's kind of like a train. Yes. It takes a while to get going. Yeah. Once my body you, gets used yeah. to the low carb, it's going to start burning the fat. That's that's right. By right, the right by, here. like episode seven hundred, we won't see you because you're going to be so thin. Oh, it's going to be amazing. We're like, guys, I'm so weak. Frail. <laughs> <laughs> no, by then, no. It's just like a two month experiment. Let's see what just we can a do two in two months. months. Right. Yeah. No, do 12 I will months. make it's both of you feel very well, good about your weight loss. After two months, I'm going to know months. if it's working. <laughs> right, and, and if, if it doesn't wor- work, yeah. If it doesn't work, you'll buy a VR headset. That's the next step. <laughs> All right, if that's my it. wife is watching, that's what we're putting my Christmas bonus toward. <laughs> <laughs> See how I pulled that off? That Thanks, good. Sasha. That no was problem. Good. Yeah, like that. that's wonderful. Hey, before we jump into the actual content of the show today, I want to remind you to uh, make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube mm-hmm. and click that bell. That's going to make sure that you are going to receive notifications anytime we are live, anytime that we are uh, posting new and superb videos here at Category 5 TV. I uh, want to say hey to everybody who's new here. If you're watching the show for the first time, it's great having you here. We've seen an increase in our viewership and uh, our subscribership on YouTube. It's good. And it's nice to have you here. So thank you for being here. So those 50 accounts that I created are helpful? (laughs) It really does make a difference, Jeff. So glad. Yeah. That was a lot of (laughs) clicking of the bell, let me tell you. (laughs) Thanks, dude. (laughs) <laughs> I was like, why is he like unsubscribing and re- resubscribing and unsubscribing? And re-sub- <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> oh, it's Jeff. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> um, uh, good times. So this week I spent some time in Toronto. Yeah. This is like second nature to you. You're there all the time. But oh, for gosh. me, this, this is week like, I was Toronto to Kingston to yeah, Hamilton and back. Place, like, yeah. So I, I headed down to Toronto because I wanted to spend some time with the folks at ESET. We wanted to talk Good about people. yeah the cybersecurity landscape for 2020. And when we come back, we've got an interview um, that I held with uh, with Raf Bavar. He's one of the lead um, sales engineers, they call them. But basically, he's the tech guru at, uh, at the head office at ESET. We're going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the, the, the evolution of cyber threats, what ESET themselves themselves are seeing, how you can protect yourselves in business, and kind of what they expect to see over the next 12 months. So stick around for that interview. It's coming up right after this. had the pleasure this past Monday to head down to Toronto. I jumped on the train about six o'clock in the morning. And then when I got off 
the train at Union Station in Toronto, mm -hmm. I was met by um, some of the, the, the head folks from ESET Canada and got to spend the day speaking with ESET Canada about some of the, the evolution of cyber threats. What can customers and viewers and individuals in Canada and the U.S. expect to come across this year? Here we are in 2020. What should we expect in the cyber threat landscape? And so it was a great opportunity for me to express kind of my own concerns and opinions. And, and, and it was really nice to have been well received by ESET Canada. And indeed, even following up on that, um, ESET North America also following up and, and, you know, thanking me for the time to, to be there and, and sharing with, uh, with the ESET staff um, the direction that I feel um, that things should go. And, and, um, it was a great opportunity for me to learn more about how threats are evolving. And, and I always try to keep on top of the latest technology trends and threats are a really big part of tech because I need to protect myself. I need to protect right. my customers and I need to be responsible to you, my viewers, and, and help you to be ready and prepared for the threats that are coming over the horizon here as uh, you know, here the first month of January starts to wrap up. Uh, the first month of 2020, I should say, January being that month. The first month. Yes. Yep. You I know, know what you're what saying. You knew <laughs> what I meant. January does feel very long, though. But we're really, it does. I mean, we're seeing an evolution in malware. We're seeing things transition from viruses mm -hmm. to malware mm -hmm. to ransomware, and now even fileless attacks. We're seeing hardware attacks and firmware infiltrations and things that we've never, ever even encountered before. But those are very real threats here as we enter 2020. So the opportunity arose and I spent some time there. I want to jump into an interview uh, with Raf Bavar uh, at ESET headquarters in Toronto, Ontario. Raf, yeah. hey, how are you, man? Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm very well, thanks. Uh, can you tell the folks who are watching a little bit about what you do here at ESET headquarters? So, Robbie, I am actually the sales engineer. Uh, I am the lead sales engineer for the for the ESET team in Canada, and I am mostly the tech guy that will support sales uh, in general mm -hmm. uh, within the Canadian territory. So, a very technical mind, uh, and yes. very familiar with the inner <laughs> yeah. workings of the products. Yep, I am the one that has all the geeky talk with the other techs and Perfect. the customers. Yeah, uh, and and the the main driver for that is to be able to technically position the products and see if we can address all the customer requirements. Sure. So part of that comes from uh, educating end users to understand what the cybersecurity threat landscape looks like. Absolutely. Yeah. And we've really, really seen that change over the past couple of years. I think especially, was it 2017 when WannaCry dropped? Uh, so yes. So this is like the yep. first ransomware that really made its way around yep. the world and, and was really, really huge. How did that impact the direction of a company and like ESET? We should not see any any numbers going down whenever it comes to the ransomware. It's still the, the really prevalent. Sure. And, and, and everybody in a way is kind of experiencing it. Uh, we do have a pretty good protection against it. So I, I, I don't expect my existing customers that are running updated products and everything mm -hmm. uh, from being impacted to those threats. Mm -hmm. But it's something that's already very, very uh, live, very, very present in our day-to-day -day operations. Um, something else that I that I usually highlight uh, on the on the threat landscape that we have uh, recently is the upcoming releases of the fileless malwares. So if oh. you, if if you have, for example, uh, an endpoint security product that's running on your computer, either an AV anti malware or or whichever name you you prefer to call it. Yeah. Um, I still have uh, the need to scan files. So, however, the idea of a fileless malware is there's no files. Okay. So how do you scan something if it's it's not available on your computer? So those those malwares are in general being uh, running by scripts on raw web pages, malicious web pages. Right. 
and the most common one today is probably the coin miners so it's a script that will run on a given computer and that computer will start mining bitcoins mm. for the for the malwares so you call it these <clears throat> fileless malware so it, does that mean that it just loads right into ram from a website yes it will actually be it it will be a script that will be running in memory uh, whenever you, you go to those websites mm -hmm. and if your existing endpoint security product cannot scan or cannot protect your memory in real time yeah. you will be susceptible to, to that kind of threat in general so it sounds to me like another like WannaCry as the first kind of example of ransomware yeah another threat where basic like Antivirus. I'm yep, going to use the absolutely. term antivirus because yep. you hear uh, anti malware is a term that we in the industry use these yep. days because really it's not just viruses that yep. we're dealing with That's threats correct. anymore. So, so is antivirus is it sufficient anymore? I don't. I don't believe antivirus has been sufficient for a long time. So not only we have the viruses out there, yeah. uh, we have those fileless malwares. We have the crypto. Uh, actors in general, the ransomwares. Mm -hmm. We have Trojans, we have backdoors, we have exploits. So in general, is antivirus enough? No. Is it better than not having anything? Yes. Sure. But if you have the option, and yes, you do have the options, sometimes you're talking about $1 more expensive or something like that, right. you can go to a full suite of, of an endpoint security product, mm -hmm. which will provide you a much better uh, protection, overall protection on your computer. Right. Okay, so I don't want to, I don't want to give the impression that this is a sales pitch that we're trying to say, you know, choose ESET endpoint protection mm -hmm. advanced because it's a sales pitch. I, I want to <laughs> instead kind of what what features of a product like endpoint protection advanced is mm -hmm. it that are taking protection to the next level for those users? So fileless attacks, yep, ransomware attacks, like these are threats that can take businesses and put them out of business yep, yep. The, and, and bankrupt their owners. Yeah, absolutely. Like, that's the, the risk threats, is insane. Yeah. yeah. So what, what features so, are those more advanced? Why do I need to pay more, essentially? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, specifically to ESET, the modules that we add those more advanced features is called HIPS, which stands for Host Intrusion Prevention System. Okay. And that's where we have the advanced memory scanner, which is basically protecting your memory in real time. The fileless And, and that's attacks? mostly associated to the fileless mm -hmm. malware. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the exploit blockers. So let's say whenever a new company releases a publicly available exploit for a vulnerability, let's say this week we actually had a pretty severe vulnerability with Microsoft yes. and they actually released a patch the next day or something like that, uh, we will prevent that vulnerability from being exploited. We are this not, is exactly what ESET accomplished with WannaCry. Absolutely, it was, yes. It was yes. E eternal it was, blue. It was, yep, it was the Samba vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, we were able to actually prevent that vulnerability from being exploited in the first place. So even though WannaCry had never been discovered before, yep. ESET was already proactively protecting Absolutely. its users. Absolutely. And so we were, were actually talking. providing that kind of uh, fix two weeks before WannaCry actually existed. Fantastic. So we had that kind of preventive yep. maintenance, let's say, yeah. on, our, on our product. And you want an anti malware product that is going to be proactive instead of reactive absolutely yes because in, in the case of something like ransomware you can lose everything yep yep and so there is no reactive response to that other yep. than I hope your backups are good yes and, and actually uh, going back to that initial question about yeah. the, the current threat landscape you are seeing the still you're seeing a really prevalent uh, presence of the ransomware however now the 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 crypto actors in this, in this general, they're not only encrypting your data and holding you for a ransom, but if you're not paying, they're actually releasing the data and selling that data. Oh, so it so can it be even worse. Theft yes, as well. that can okay. be even worse. Yeah, so, wow, <laughs> yeah. that's scary stuff. Uh, so what else does, uh, does your product, so again, to, to just look at why, I, I get the question all the time, Raf. Yep. Why should I buy the greater product when the antivirus has been working so well for me for so long? So as you said, it might be a couple bucks more, a dollar yep. or so more per seat, which can be a lot if you've got 10,000 computers, but in a, yep. in a small, medium business, it's not that much. Why would I pay more? The additional features that we have in the full endpoint security solution uh, 
from a technical perspective, and mm -hmm. again, I'm talking about one yeah. or two dollars more, yeah. uh, is well worth it. The value is actually there. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of uh, not only adding additional layers of protection to your computer, mm -hmm. either at home or, or, or at your business, okay. uh, but I'm also getting additional visibility on what's happening on your environment as well. So let's say one of the features on that new, uh, on, on that bigger product, let's say the endpoint security, mm -hmm. is a personal firewall, which will potentially replace your Windows firewall in right. your computer. And not only it will allow you to actually have uh, visibility on the network layer. So instead of only looking for viruses or Trojans or ransomware, yeah, yeah. I'm also looking for duplicate IP address. I'm looking for DNS poisoning. I'm That's interesting that you poisoning. state that. Yeah. 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 So, so ne po possibly network traffic problems are even absolutely shown. yes which are not necessarily uh, uh, security incidents but yeah. it can be an actual threat so for example mm -hmm. one of the, the detections that we have is a port scanning so maybe right. your user is, is or a given actor in, inside your network is scanning uh, your servers for yeah. whatever reason whereas they are not supposed to be doing that so mm -hmm. yeah it gives you that visibility so you can actually go to the user and have a conversation and see what's, what's going on yeah i've never really thought about that as a threat yeah because like a, a duplicate ip address you just think oh well i accidentally assigned yep. the same ip to a printer yep. or something but what if it's a threat actor exactly yeah maybe Who's someone is spoofing spoof. that, yeah. that ip address yeah mm -hmm. interesting and uh, you mentioned about the firewall how and, and I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but Absolutely. I mean, Microsoft Windows 10 comes with a firewall. Yep. So do I really need to supplement my anti-malware with a firewall for Misa? We do see uh, two main approaches for, for uh, that replacement, let's say. Mm -hmm. So the first one is ease of use. So we do provide a management console that will allow you to have a much more user-friendly configuration and deployment of that, that specific Are feature. Are we talking centralized management? Absolutely, so, yes. Okay, so all 10,000 of my computers? Yeah, absolutely. Everything all in the same place. five of my computers you are You just in create one the place. policies and ah. you push it out to your computers. Yeah. It's, okay. Again, it's fully automated, so it's, it's pretty convenient to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second main reason is the visibility. So you do have access to a lot of reporting that's actually coming from the, main, the, the actual firewall component. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say you can get a list of all the users on your network that had a port scanner on your environment on a given okay. time frame. Yeah. So that's the kind of awareness and the kind of visibility that some other uh, vendors will not allow you to have. Mm. Great. So looking at now, here we are, it's 2020. Yep. yep. Q1 2020. Being that we're here at ESAT headquarters, what kind of threats are we preparing for in this new year? Is, is there an evolution, like in 2017, we really saw an evolution from viruses to yep. ransomware, and things are continuing to progress. Yep. You mentioned fileless attacks. What else are we so looking So thank for? you for, for actually uh, uh, touching base on that one, and I will actually look at the camera and say, everybody, we have the so the, the malwares or the, the, the actual evil players uh, in the industry, every single day they are going better and better and better. So it's not only important to renew your license, it's imperative that you guys actually keep your ESET products or any other product that you might have today as updated as possible. So you have the evolution of the ransomware, you have the evolution of the file as a malware. If you are running your antivirus or your anti-malware product from three years ago, you might be losing some advan advanced features in there. Mm. So you might be actually lagging behind and sometime they will eventually win over your computer and you might experience some, some loss or some incidents in general. So it's really important as a vendor, to be as updated as possible. Whenever we release a new, a, new feature, a new feature or a new version of the product, it's important that you actually try to be as updated as possible. Work with your vendor, work with your partner, work with your IT department, so, so you, you are well protected. Um, we are seeing, um, coming back to your question, mm -hmm. we are seeing a lot of, of the, the movements in general uh, whenever we are looking at the, the data. So we are seeing a lot of uh, the new threats coming from two main um, avenues, let's say. Uh, so the first one is hardware. So whenever thinking of firmware, for example, you have a BIOS update, you have a new chipset on your computer. Yes, it's actually possible to infect or to, to, to infect that, that given uh, component on your computer. 
Wow. Um, another point that we have, and we actually have a lot of research going on on that specific one, is the user behavior. So let's say that usually when you think user behavior, probably the biggest example is credit card uh, company. So mm -hmm. you have your credit card in Canada, that credit card has been used in somewhere in Asia, and hey, uh, even though online shopping is available everywhere, it might create a trigger. Hey, it's not, that, that card mm -hmm. is not supposed to be used in, in Asia, for example, in Europe or anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and we are started to see some, some, some efforts uh, from different vendors actually to try to correlate all the incidents or all the the, the, the incidents in general the security incidents that we flag uh, and we also try to map that to the actual user behavior so hey okay. that user has just had his email access in canada being accessed in europe maybe that's a user that's always traveling so yeah it's kind of expected maybe not that user is an internal user he has no reason to mm. have that kind of uh, exposure in there so we can actually create a ticket and we can flag that as, as a potential uh, incident so mm -hmm. your admins can can take a look at that interesting and we can do that so this is not as a third-party service, but as an in, internal absolutely, service that yes, our absolutely. IT department yep. and, is and, administering. And again, the, the amount of data that's coming out of those services uh, is, is, is so big that automation is, is critical for that. That's so great. we do have a lot of automation capabilities in our products. Yeah. Um, and again, it's everything to make your life easier. And I've, I've never really thought of it outside the context of the credit card. Like it's yep. a perfect example. Yep. If I've used it, and you see it sometimes where it's, it's an inconvenience, but if your credit card ever was stolen and used maliciously, yep. then you want to know about it. And yep. here's a service that you're offering and evolving in 2020 that yep. is in-house. So yeah, I, absolutely, have, yeah. I have control over that data. Yeah. So staff. you're thinking of your credit card, what if it's yeah. your email access or maybe your SIM number? Mm -hmm. uh, public data, basically. It, it's private, it should be private, and we are trying to make it remain private. So is that the evolution of malware, do you think, is targeting data? Uh, yeah, I would say so. Uh, I, I still don't see specific um, data to, to confirm that that affirmation, yeah. but I do believe that's that's something that's going to happen. We are having we are we as as, as citizens we are actually uh, producing more data every single day. The amount of data that we have associated to our profiles uh, is massive, either from financial data, healthcare data, uh, social networking data, work data, basically. So we should see uh, more uh, custom attacks targeting specific users on specific organizations. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, well, Raf, it's been a pleasure having you here. We've learned Thanks a for lot. Having me, man. I don't want to overwhelm the viewers. Um, Grand scheme of things, I mean, 2020 is going to be an interesting year, I think, from the cybersecurity landscape. Absolutely. Are we still seeing attacks in the ransomware end of things? Are we still, yes. even though ESET customers are generally uh, protected against that? Yes, there's still a lot of ransomware going on. Uh, I don't see that going down, mm -hmm. not, 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 not in the near future at least. Uh, it, it's, it's still evolving and the, the, the actual uh, organizations, they're actually organizations on the back end uh, that are running with those ransomwares, they are still making a profit. That's the so, thing, yeah. So, yeah. The question for years when it was just viruses on the landscape, yep. the question was always, what's the motivation of a hacker yep. to do this? Yep. And you say, well, money. Yep. Because they make money. Ransomware is a perfect yep. example yep. where it's like, well, they're bringing in a ton of money in order to create malware. Yep. yep. Which, you know, if that's a scary thing. So, thank you for working to combat that. Thanks, man. Now, of course, you can find out more about the particular protections that we were discussing there by visiting the website endpointsecurity.ca. And incidentally, we've got some more um, video um, help and, and some great educational content there that is really geared toward businesses. Mm -hmm. So um, that information is there as a resource for you to be able to, uh, to just watch videos that help you to understand the threat landscape. and and with that uh, at endpointsecurity.ca, you're able to arm yourself with more information. And as I kind of mentioned and alluded to in the interview, it's not a sales pitch for a particular product or brand, but it is an educational piece that helps you to understand what you need to know because things are really evolving 
ESET has proven yeah. themselves to be, uh, as we talked about with WannaCry, very, very proactive, mm -hmm. um, being able to block a threat before it was even uh, an actual thing. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> even a thing. They actually blocked the exploit that allowed the thing to exist. Right. So then when the thing existed, the exploit was already blocked by ESET. So, so that proactive nature of the protection to me is like, that's where it's at. That's what I want. Um, they do have Linux services available as well. Um, incidentally, their um, centralized management console that we discussed mm -hmm. is based uh, on a Linux environment. So oh, the cool. one that they provide is CentOS. I have a GitHub repository that allows you to install it on Debian Buster. Um, that is uh, github.com slash cat TV slash ESET. You'll see the installers there if you're interested. So there's a whole lot of support there. And uh, endpointsecurity.ca is a great place that it all comes together with blogs, videos, podcasts, of course, the products themselves, recommendations for what would work in your environment. Um, so if you're in business, that's where you want to go. Endpointsecurity.ca. Yep. Big thanks to Raf for being a part of the show this week and everyone else for hosting me at uh, ESET Canada in, uh, in Toronto. That was cool. It was a great day. For today, we've got to head over to the newsroom. So, Sasha, if you're ready for us. I am. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Hey, Windows users, are you still using Internet Explorer? Stop it. There's yet another zero-day exploit that will give hackers the ability to remotely take over your computer. Pine 64's $200 pro-grade Linux laptop is now available with a U.S. keyboard and customers who pre-ordered theirs are receiving the first shipment now. Secu a security shocker out of Microsoft as it has been revealed that 250 million customer records have been exposed online. Mm. And not to create false hope, but this is too huge not to mention. Scientists at Cardiff University have discovered a part of our immune system that can kill prostate, breast, lung, and other cancers in lab, in lab tests. Stick around, the full details are coming up later in the show. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. I'm Sasha Rickman, joined this week by Jeff Weston and Robbie Ferguson. All right, some quick honorable mentions this week, or at least one. Hey, you ready for this? Patrick Stewart appeared on The View this week wow. and personally invited host Whoopi Goldberg to appear in the second season of Star Trek Picard. Make it so. Yes, sir. While promoting the premiere of the Picard series, Stewart surprised Goldberg, saying, quote, I'm here with a formal... Uh, <clears throat> I'm here with a formal invitation. It's for you, Whoopi. Well, for me. Um, Alex Kurtzman, who is the senior executive producer of Star Trek Picard, oh. and all of his oh. colleagues, of which I am one, want to invite you into the second season. Oh. Stewart's invitation was met with a big smile from Whoopi, who played the beloved and timeless Guinan character in Star Trek The Next Generation. Since the, uh, well, as soon as the applause from the studio audience subsided and following a warm hug between the two actors, Whoopi responded enthusiastically saying, yes. Good. Season two of Star Trek Picard was already confirmed a month before the first season even began airing. Wow. Other confirmed TNG alumni are Jonathan Frakes as William Riker, Marina Sirtis as Deanna Troy, Brent Spiner as Data, a.k.a. B4. And I must say, Brent, we love you. And Jonathan Del Arco as Hugh of Borg. Also along for the show is Star Trek Voyager's Jerry Ryan as wow. Seven of Nine. Star Trek Picard is available as of January 23rd in Canada and the U.S. And the very next day, worldwide. Nice. Let's get into the top stories we're following this week. Microsoft set, sent out an advisory on Friday detailing an under-attack an under zero-day vulnerability for Internet Explorer. The scripting engine flaw can be exploited to gain remote code execution of a vulnerable machine by way of 
specifically crafted a specifically crafted web page. While this particular flaw can be mitigated by restricting access to the JavaScript component jscript.dll, there is no patch available to actually fix the vulnerability. Even if Microsoft is swift to create a patch, they plan to release it on an upcoming Patch Tuesday. Since we know that's the second Tuesday of each month, they're leaving this takeover exploit active in the wild for a good four weeks or so at least. These kinds of horrendous security practices are another reminder of why we shouldn't be trusting Microsoft to provide our antivirus too. There is no practical reason to be running Internet Explorer these days. If you must use Microsoft Windows, download Chrome, Firefox, or better yet, get the Brave private what excuse me, private browser from cat5.tv slash brave to automatically block ads while you surf the web. It's brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Microsoft has been continually letting us down. Windows 10 has been a nightmare. Mm -hmm. Has Microsoft ever not let us down? I mean, maybe back like Windows 93, 95? We can say that, but I mean, it, it, it felt like ago. they, no, it did feel like they were giving it an effort back then. At, at one point. Yeah. I mean, they had the beta team, they had um, the, the testing team before patches went out. and But stuff like this and having to wait four weeks yes, for an crazy. actively exploited issue that's the thing. that is a takeover bug. Mm -hmm. Like, this is something that could completely compromise an entire network of machines. And so if somebody, a, a miscreant, knows of the vulnerability within, let's say, a, a business network mm -hmm. and actively exploits it, because it is, like, understand, folks, this is an exploit that is currently being used by hackers to infiltrate networks. Mm -hmm. It right. is currently being used. So if that's the case, wouldn't it be prudent for a company like Microsoft to say, we need to fix this and we need to fix this now? now. Yes. Instead, they're waiting a month. <laughs> At least. At least four weeks. I mean, we're talking the, the second Tuesday of February. Why four weeks, though? Like, why? That's, would... that's arbitrary. It's just the second Tuesday of every month why? is when they issue their patches. Yeah. Well, I, I get now? that, but yeah, why not push through an update? Because they don't. Because it's it, the rollout happens on on that schedule. They this is the thing they've set they've set themselves up yeah. for this type of failure. See, I think, their infrastructure is set up for this type of failure now. But I don't know why they couldn't even just post it to their website and say update manually. <sighs> like nobody's going to do it. But if no, you, unless you know, their unless it, it even if for a million years, but even if you know that that patch exists, imagine if you had a hundred computers mm -hmm. and you had to manually go like yeah. the whole windows infrastructure right now is a brutal nightmare. That's true. It's just ridiculous. And, it, and it's really causing companies, especially companies that are currently stuck on window, like that have windows seven machines intermixed in their network. A lot of government right. agencies. Yeah. A lot of government agencies. And we're looking at, okay, well, what do we do next? Do we buy all new systems so we can install Windows 10? Because that's usually necessary, unless you can maybe put more RAM in them because you're going to need at least like twice as much RAM. You're going to need uh, an SSD to, you know, make it you know, like you're going to need to upgrade. You're not going to be using a five-year-old computer for Windows 10. That's for sure. No. Uh, at least not without a couple of little upgrades. So, you know, we look at that and then we say, okay, well, what other options are there? And these are things that we're going to be talking about here on the show. But it really just makes you go, wow, mm -hmm. hold on, let's back up a second and say, what's really, you know, what's, what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a wake up call too to say, maybe Microsoft has got way too much control over our corporation been saying that for yeah. decades <laughs> and a lot of people have and i don't and i'm not even saying that out of my linux bias that we call it here i'm saying that out of the reality of this is actually happening right now there is this active threat that is being exploited and microsoft is not doing a darn thing about it until the next patch tuesday yeah that's ridiculous mm -hmm. and is microsoft not 
vying for like some special government contract for something cloud related right now. You're talking like you know something, but you're not actually saying something. I've, I I feel like we've been <laughs> hearing about like there's um the the U.S. government's looking to go cloud or something, and uh, like well, Amazon, like Amazon was in on it. And there's a bunch of different companies. I thought Microsoft was in on it as well. Well, there's only the three big ones. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm thinking about stuff like this. It's like if you do any push every four weeks, if I'm vying for a government contract to create something new, you think you'd want to have a better business model? Well, like, yeah, I'm not yeah. even touching on that, like the business end of things. I'm talking like the but end this impacts users it. end of things. Right. This impacts all it of should, it. It should. It should make the governments grow, uh, like wise up and say, maybe there are more secure options out there. Yep. Maybe there are better options out there. And that, that, my dear friends, is where my Linux bias comes in. That's right. It's true. <laughs> well, and speaking of Linux. Yes, this is a great story. Are you ready for this? Here we go. Pine64's $200 pro-grade Linux laptop is now available with a U.S. keyboard, and customers who pre-ordered theirs are receiving the first shipment now. Nice. The Pinebook Pro ships with a customized version of Debian pre-installed. That's right. This is a true Linux laptop. It also has a few other tricks up its sleeve, like a bootable micro SD card slot so that you can easily run another operating system off a cheap memory card whenever you feel like it. Just about all laptop, all laptop computers use Intel processors these days. Only a very small percentage of Windows laptops have started using Qualcomm ARM processors. The Pinebook Pro actually uses a 64-bit ARM processor called the Rockchip RK3399 with a Mali T860 MP4 GPU, which is made by the same company that makes the Pinebook Pro, Pine Microsystems Inc. Pine also makes other computing hardware such as compute modules and single board computers that you can build into other projects. And as Robbie mentioned last week, they're even, they even bring a cheap privacy focused smartphone to market that runs Linux natively. The Pinebook Pro includes four gigabytes of RAM, which is the maximum supported by the rock chip. So it's not upgradable. By default, it also includes a 64 gigabyte EMMC storage module, which you can upgrade if you want. But as Westerners, the biggest problem we had with the original Pinebook and even the first run of Pinebook Pro was the keyboard. There's just no way to get reviewers or in, end users in Canada or the US to truly love an ISO keyboard, which is a layout more familiar to users in the UK. But now, as of last week, users who pre-ordered are receiving their ANSI keyboard Pinebook Pros. ANSI is more commonly called the U.S. keyboard layout. So for $200, Linux fans can get a solid, professional, and super sleek laptop that has keys where they expect them. So how can a Pine64 sell such a fine piece of kit for only $200? because they love you, that's why. Actually, that's not even sarcasm. The Pinebook Pro is being sold at cost as a gift to the open source loving community, so it's not technically meant for regular users. If you believe in freedom and like to tinker and learn about technology, the Pinebook Pro is meant for you. This is awesome. I said it last week with no words, but Pine64. Yeah. This is so good. I like it. Yeah. Now, when people first purchased the original Pine Books and the Pine Book Pros, did they know it was coming with the alternate keyboard? Or were they expecting the a Pine US Book style? Pro? Yes. The Pine Book never did. The okay. Pine Book came with the ISO keyboard. That's what it came with. And we right. were, when we reviewed it here on the show, you remember, like, it was right. like, I can't get my head around this thing. And for those of you who live in the UK and places where the ISO keyboard is standard, <laughs> like, what are you talking you're like, about? this is great. This is fantastic. But no, when you're used to an American layout, it's completely different. And it seems completely whacked. I mean, 
<laughs> I've seen reviews online and, and I, I'm part of that where it's like, I just can't get my head around the ISO keyboard layout. My keyboard is a French layout and Robbie doesn't even oh, like it. Oh my goodness. So. Yeah, I mean, we're here in Canada, <laughs> up here in Studio T. And government, I don't know if it's legislation or what, says that things have to be French and English combined. So if you walk into a super center and buy a laptop, it's yeah. a French English keyboard and keys are all over the place. Yeah. And so even when I was setting it up with with Cloud Ready, it was like I was pushing the wrong keys. Yeah. I just uh, because <laughs> that's how I always type, just pushing the wrong keys. <laughs> <laughs> so I've never noticed a difference in keyboard to be honest. Maybe you've just never had to experience that. Right. But well, I, I guess, but I mean, we're like... We're not connoisseurs of fine keyboards. Well, every keyboard I use, like, <laughs> I, I recognize that they're all going to be different, so I just roll with it. But I suppose what happens is that they don't all have to be different, and do you, that's... Do you touch type? Like, do you type 180 words a minute, like Robbie? Like 180? It, if it's... Are you if, a cyborg, my if friend? It's out of the, if it's out of place, I am going to push the wrong keys. Because the keys are meant to be where my fingers are trained to know that they are. I, I could Sasha like was 60? commenting before the show. He is like magic. Before the show, I was, was doing like, this on your what, and you're like Yeah, he's like, What's your password? Because he needed it to get into my And life. it's like all this like and all so characters I, mine and uppercase, is like lowercase. One of those and, suggest a strong password yeah, passwords yeah. that's like this long and, and like, it bloop has bloop. symbols that I didn't even know the name of. One yeah. of them is a tilde. Tilde. Yeah. Yeah. Um anyway. Which so on a I French just, keyboard, incidentally, is in the wrong blooming place. So I just show Old Robbie, my phone, and he was just like -do 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 -do, looking at the phone, yeah. just typing for a minute. That's how it know. works, right? Done. On a French keyboard, too. Yeah. So I added a slash at the end there because that's where the enter key ah. is supposed to be. <laughs> so, yeah, knowing that now an so, ANSI keyboard is available, which is the US layout, exactly. I'm very excited about I that. I really appreciate, too, that they're selling it at cost. Yeah. To me, it feels like a big hug. Like, it's a, it's just a nice Surely. thing to know that a company cares that much. And at Pine64, I've always felt, cares about, respects... And is even a part of that open source community. Mm -hmm. yes. And there's a mindset, there's like a spirit about the open source community, the true open source community. Not the, there, there's kind of two facets of it. There's the, the angry, like, if you use Windows, you are the devil side of open source. And yeah. then there's the side that just really loves freedom and really loves community support and yes. giving help to people and becoming part of communities and becoming part of online forums and helping other people like there's that aspect and that's the aspect that i really feel pine 64 really falls into mm -hmm. and so to offer yeah something like the pine book pro which is a beautiful notebook computer in two different models now I know. for awesome. iso and ansi so they heard the call of the reviewers mm -hmm. here in canada and the u.s yes and they're offering it at cost for 200 bucks so that's awesome that is what great. So for the cost of a premium Chromebook, you're getting a, a computer that you can just slap Linux on. It comes with Linux. Yep. It's got more power. It's got a lot of oomph. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm really, really keen and excited about the Pinebook Pro. So That's well good. done, Pine64, and to the community at Pine64. I mean, we love you here at Category 5. Yes, we do. And uh, certainly appreciate the entire team. So thank you for all that yes. you do. We've got to take a quick break. More of our this week's top tech news stories are coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back. A security shocker out of Microsoft as it has been revealed that 250 million customer records have been exposed online. I feel like this is a face palm moment. We really don't intend for the news to be all about Microsoft, but this week has been a doozy. There's the Internet Explorer zero-day vulnerability that's being actively exploited, yet Microsoft has, hasn't has issued a patch for. That revelation came just days after the U.S. government issued a critical alert to Windows users concerning the extraordinarily serious curveball crypto vulnerability. And now this, 250 million Microsoft customer records spanning an incredible 14 years in all have been exposed online in a database with no password protection. 
Wow. The data was accessible to anyone with a web browser who stumbled across the databases. According to the report issued by the security researcher team at Comparatech, no authentication at all was required to access them. The nature of the data appears to be that, mu that much of the personally identifiable information that was redacted. However, the researchers say that many contain plain text data, including customer email addresses, IP addresses, geographical locations, descriptions of customer service and support claims, cases, Microsoft support agent emails, case numbers and resolutions, and internal notes that had been marked as confidential. Hmm. While this may seem like no big deal considering the number of breaches, many of which affecting even more users. The thing to consider here is that Microsoft support scams are already rampant, and it doesn't take a genius to work out how valuable actual customer information could be to the fraudsters carrying out such attacks. And it puts users at a severe disadvantage and risk of being exploited by someone pretending to be the very company they trust. Microsoft Security Response Center posted a response dated January 22nd, 2020. In that post, they confirmed that the exposure of the database started on December 5th, 2019 as a result of misconfigured security rules and was fixed on December 31st. It's not known at this point if the databases were accessed, but it seems very, very likely. Since White Hat security researchers picked up on the issue and even replicated its data to their own servers, it's very likely bad actors also got their hands on it. <sighs> very, just yet another. Yeah. Yeah. Just another. It's what is going on at like, Microsoft? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm sitting here going like, what do you say? It's like. Yeah. <sighs> it's that's a disheartening story so i guess what it comes down to is the the only thing we can say i mean uh, sure you're face palming i'm disgusted mm -hmm. you as as potential victims need to understand that you just need to be very very conscious that this has happened mm -hmm. yep. you have to be very conscious that phishing scams and now spear phishing scams exist. Yes. So these are now, they have your information. You have a Microsoft account, right? You've contacted their support or activated software. So now somebody can call you and say, I'm calling from Microsoft and uh, I've got yeah, your case number here and blah, blah, blah. And I've got enough evidence on this piece of paper to be able to prove to you that I am who right. I say I am. Right. Yeah. Just like the last time we spoke when we mm -hmm. offered you this and this and yeah. this. Remember I, that? Yeah. Yeah. Remember the time that you called just a couple of weeks ago and we talked about this and that? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, we just found out that there's another exploit. And so I need to remote into your computer to fix that for you. Exactly. So all of a sudden there's this. Okay, wait, 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 hold up. So here's what you need to do. Hang up the phone. Yes. Okay. Microsoft does not phone its users. Mm -hmm. Microsoft will not offer you support. That's not the industry that they are in. That's right. That's not how they work. Mm -hmm. And so just understand that. And maybe if you just at least uh, at least make yourself critical enough to be able to say, Microsoft does not offer this service. Mm -hmm. If you can just say that to yourself, then maybe that's enough to protect you so that when that call comes in or when that email comes in, that you just don't click it. And remember, right. last week we learned as well. Last week we learned that a new form of cookie attack is allowing... Um, hackers to compromise PayPal accounts just by you clicking on a link that takes you to a site that creates the session. And then you can close that and come back to it two weeks later and log into the legitimate paypal.com website and boom, they've got your information. So we yep. know that if you just fall for it enough to click the link, they could have put something on your computer yeah. that's enough to get you next time. So even if you don't fall for it this time, maybe you click the link and you don't give them your information, but you mm -hmm. clicked the link. Don't click the link. Right. 
Stop yourself at that point and realize Microsoft doesn't offer this service. I am not going to click a link in an email that says log into my Microsoft account or any Microsoft service. So yeah. understand that's Office 365, that's Exchange, that's that's your um, like your um, what is it? Microsoft Online, even services, Xbox, whatever Xbox like, 360 Online or whatever. All, all that Xbox stuff. Online. Yeah, all that stuff. Uh, Microsoft Online account for for your Minecraft and, and like all these things. Mm hmm. You're compromised. Yep. So don't trust anything that comes in now. Period. Yes. And that, that's, that's a blanket statement. Don't trust anything now. You have to decide. You have to go to your bank website and log in correctly. Mm -hmm. You don't yep. ever, don't ever click a link that takes you there. Never. Never. Don't Google it. Don't search it in Bing. Don't, don't type it in the search. Don't type your bank's name in the search and click the first link on the results. No, you type in oh, your... Do people do that? People, people do, do that. that. Oh, yeah. And those same hurts. people get compromised. So, wow. Okay. Yeah. Let's move on to All better right. news. <laughs> not to create false hope, but this is too huge not to mention. Scientists at Cardiff University have discovered a part of our immune system that can kill prostate, breast, lung, and other cancers in lab tests. The findings published in Nature Immunology have not yet been tested in patients, but the researchers say that they have enormous potential. Experts are saying that although the work was still at an early stage, it is very exciting. Our immune system is our body's natural defense against infection, but it also attacks cancerous cells. The scientists were looking for unconventional and previously undiscovered ways the immune system naturally attacks tumors. What they found was a T cell inside people's blood. This is an immune cell that can scan the body to assess whether there is a threat that needs to be eliminated. The difference is that the one in particular that they discovered can seemingly attack a wide range of cancers. Researcher Professor Andrew Sewell says, quote, there is a chance to treat every patient. Previously, nobody believed this could be possible. It raises the prospect of a one-size-fits-all cancer treatment, a single type of T-cell that could be capable of destroying many different types of cancers across the population, end quote. The discovered T cell was able to kill a wide range of cancerous cells in, in the lab, including lung, skin, blood, colon, breast, bone, prostate, ovarian, kidney, and cervical cancer cells. Wow. Crucially, it left normal tissues untouched. Exactly how it does all this is still being explored. The idea is that a blood sample would be taken from a cancer patient. The T cells in the sample would be extracted and genetically modified so that they were, they were reprogrammed to make the cancer-finding receptor. The upgraded cells would be grown in vast quantities in the laboratory and then put back into the patient. Daniel Davis, a professor of immunology at the University of Manchester, said, quote, at the moment, this is very basic research and not close for to actual medicines for patients. There is no question that is a very exciting discovery, both for advancing our basic knowledge about the immune system and the possibility of future new medicines, end quote. More safety checks will be needed before human trials can begin. Wow. I like this. This isn't yeah. necessarily a tech story, but it's it, a human interest story yes. that is here because of tech. Sure. Yes. The advancements yeah. that we have made in science to be able to get to the point where it's like, what else is there? Mm -hmm. Let's explore the body even further. Let's alter this cell and see what happens. Yes. And boom, suddenly we're going, is this it? That is so cool. Exactly. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is right now, cancer treatments are just, they seem so barbaric barrack right now they're life-saving but they're super intrusive so yeah. i mean you know the chemotherapy surgery the things that that are just really radiation things that are really detrimental to the human human body just to keep it alive if yeah. you can have an immune response against cancer that 
that just annihilates any t- trace of it. I just cannot wait. I don't to know. See. Like, does anyone else feel that like excitement and the anticipation? Like, could it be? Like, could that be yeah. possible? And from what I understand, all they're doing is taking the T cell that you already produce out and they're just replicating it. Like they're kind of growing more. Well, they're they're altering it to put in the receptor to find the cancer cells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a bit of a genetic modification. And then they're culturing more. So there can't be adverse reactions because it's your own. Sure. Oh, I mean, there could, I, I don't under, I don't understand the I science. I can't yeah. pretend to understand Sounds the science. Good. But I know <laughs> there was a time in our history when um, penicillin didn't exist, mm-hmm. and yeah. when and when it was discovered, if you will, no, it was and, a mistake. Yeah, but so yeah. When penicillin it was, was an accident. But then, so when it was accidentally discovered, how earth shatteringly. Like how many lives were saved? How many yes. lives were improved because of it? It's you know what? I was having a conversation with one of my clients the other day and her older siblings were born before penicillin. Oh and wow. She said the reason I'm not deaf is because penicillin existed oh, wow. for me and not for my brothers. Oh, wow. Right? So it's heartbreaking penic- and right? yet at the same time it's like it's awesome. the dawn of a new era. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. It's very cool. So are we at that point with cancer? I don't think we are, but but I'm hopeful. I'm like, I'm so hopeful in humanity and, and our, our ability to accomplish that because I just want that. Yeah. That's a good news story. Yeah. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash, Che Cobb, and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash newsroom. From the Category 5.TV newsroom, I'm Sasha Rickman. And I'm Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Jeff Weston. It's been great having you here with us this week, folks. Thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again next week. Don't forget, though, before we sign off, to make sure you subscribe to us on our, uh, I mean, follow us on Twitter. We're Mm -hmm. at Category 5 TV. I'm personally on Twitter, at Robbie Ferguson. You can follow all the exploits of my culinary delights, (laughs) for example. (laughs) And uh, and see selfies of me bouncing around on trampolines with my nine-year-old son. So that's that's Good. at Robbie Ferguson, and that's a lot of fun. Uh, we're also on Facebook. We're on YouTube. We're everywhere on the Internet. Just do a search for Category 5 Technology TV, and we will be there. And we look forward to having you part of this community. Thanks, everybody. Take care. See you. Bye.